be joined with, by two independent experts who will be well known to all of you from their appearances and advocacy on the airwaves in recent months. Uh, Professor Gab Gabriel Scali and Dr. Tomas Ryan. Dr. Sc Professor Scali is President of the Epidemiology, Epidemiology and Public Health Section of the Royal Society of Medicine, Visiting Professor of Public Health at the University of Bristol and the University of West of England, and of course in Ireland, very well known for chairing the inquiry into cervical check in 2018. And he's, he's involved with the Independent Stage Group in the UK, which is the Independent Scientific Advisory Group. Uh, for emergencies. Uh, Dr. Tomas Ryan, I know very well, Tomas as a colleague in Trinity, and he's Associate Professor in the Trinity School of Biochemistry and Immunology and uh, the Trinity Institute of Neuroscience and involved in research funded by the European Research Council and formerly was at MIT. And he's an advocate here for Zero COVID with the Independent Scientific Advisory Group, ISAG, um, which has been really promoting so strongly the crush, contain and chase strategy. So tonight we're going to look at how we can implement strategies to tackle COVID to get us to a COVID elimination point. And I'll be putting a series of questions to our panellists and we'll then be inviting questions and questions from the floor and we'll be finishing before eight o'clock. I'm going to start with you, Alan, if you don't mind. I'm going to ask you to tell us about the Labour Party's motion tomorrow in the Dáil, how the party is going to be using our time in the Dáil to put forward this idea of a national aggressive suppression strategy. What does it mean and what will you be calling on the government to do? Uh, thank you, Ivana. And I want to thank uh, Gabriel and Tomás for giving us their time tonight uh, for this hour. We really appreciate it as a party. Um, this is a very important topic. Uh, tomorrow in the Dáil, we are putting forward our case for zero COVID, our national aggressive suppression strategy. Uh, essentially, we believe that at this juncture, uh, we have to suppress the virus uh, down to the minimum uh, so that we can give people some hope and uh, bring about some form of uh, changes so that society can exist and we can have some form of different form of living uh, later on in the year. This has happened in other jurisdictions um, and it has worked. Uh, we have a complication here with the border, but we believe that can be dealt with. Essentially, our strategy, uh, what we're putting forward, is that we have to bring in mandatory quarantine in this uh, country uh, in relation to people traveling in uh, from outside, except for essential workers, uh, logistical workers. Uh, we have to have uh, PCR testing uh, in healthcare settings. We have to have uh, other forms of testing, making sure we have uh, our community antigen testing in, in scenarios where that is suitable. Um, most of all, we need to resource our public health teams. And when we drive down this uh, virus by ensuring that we have checks, uh, 5K within the border, uh, that we have a check, checks put in by the government uh, through the Health and Safety Authority as to why so many people are not working from home during this lockdown compared to other lockdowns. When you drive around the country, you can see the volume of people who are actually having to go into work. We need a survey done on all of that to actually ensure uh, that there's maximum maximum amount of people are working from home. And collectively, with all of these uh, measures, uh, along with many more, um, basically our hope is to drive down uh, the virus and then Panzer-like attack the virus with resourced public health teams. Uh, so that if there is a virus outbreak, we can deal with it in that area quickly and efficiently, uh, while the rest of the country has, um, you know, has got back to a, a certain level. I believe the government don't have a strategy at the moment. I'm asking them to support this strategy um, because, you know, living with COVID just hasn't worked. Um, you know, hopping in and out of levels all the time isn't going to work. Um, the idea that the vaccine is going to be the panacea for 2021 isn't going to transpire. And I think we need to do this now. It's our last chance. We can't have a, a fourth wave, uh, our last chance to do this. And while the vaccine is being rolled out then to the most vulnerable and those who need it the most, uh, then we'll drive down the virus and keep it down uh, while we get to a better place. Uh, thanks, Alan, for outlining the Labour position so clearly. And I, I think all of us would just be, are just thinking as we're reflecting on the position currently of the huge numbers of people who died, the huge numbers of people who've been affected by the illness uh, in our hospital still, and people who are suffering long COVID, as well as all those who've, uh, who've, had, who've had their livelihoods and businesses affected, and all of those who've missed out on school and, and, um, and so much over the last year. Um, Gabriel, Professor Sally, I might go 
to you next, if I may, to ask you about your reaction to the Labour motion, your views on what the government sh should be doing now and what would be an appropriate response. And I suppose we're speaking this evening in the light of the UK government's announcement about Hancock uh, going much closer to, to a mandatory quarantine policy today. Well, first of all, I thank you very much for inviting me along. I'm very pleased to do so, um, to be here and, and to discuss this motion, which is a very comprehensive motion. I, I think... For me, the most important thing is the idea of actually having a strategy and the demand for a strategy, because it seems like a, a strange thing to say, but uh, you would think there would be a strategy or a plan or uh, some clear path forward for dealing with the virus, but there isn't, and there isn't one in the UK uh, either. And here we have a, a, a very vicious, uh, infectious disease, easily transmissible, but we're having uh, an unacceptably large toll of avoidable deaths. So let's remember this is an avoidable disease and we need to take steps. Even at this late stage, there's a huge amount that we can do to uh, try and prevent further deaths. So it's about getting ahead of the virus. It's about getting the virus, the numbers of the virus down, the number of new cases down dramatically. Uh, to, to, to the sort of levels it was at across the whole island of Ireland during the summer with zero deaths north and south and, and very small numbers of cases. Getting it down, keeping it down by, as, uh, as the, the, the title of the motion says, an aggressive strategy to go after the virus, to get ahead, with, ahead with, of it, to stamp it out, to find it, a find, test, trace, isolate and support system, um, putting that amount of effort into it to suppress it and then keeping it out which brings us to the issue of public health controls on on ports and airports which uh, i'm very pleased that uh, the secretary of state in westminster has announced some measures today I, I i don't think they they're very late in the day we should have been preventing the the ingress of this virus right from the very beginning we should have been doing it a, a year ago and uh, we didn't, and we paid the price, and we paid the price again at the end of the summer for not, not doing it. So this is our third bite of the cherry to get it right on, on borders, I think. So let's get it right this time. Um, so uh, I'm very much in favour of uh, a good discussion about having a good strategy. That's what we need. And th the jury is no longer out on the matter of can we live with this virus. The jury is no longer out if it ever really was out on the question of, is it uh, public health versus um, the economy? Uh, it's not public health versus the economy. You can't have a successful economy if you're in the midst of a public health crisis. You can't have healthy high streets if you don't have a healthy side streets. And all of that points towards the need for a really uh, well thought through strategy, an aggressive strategy to, get, to go after the virus, to get it down and keep it down. So I very, very much welcome um, and I look uh, the motion and I look forward to listening to the debate. And I hope you will see be joined by um, many TDs from all parties supporting your motion. Thank you very much for that, Gabriel. Tomas, Dr. Ryan, I'll, I'll go to you for your reaction to that. And you've been such a powerful advocate for zero COVID over many months now, but you know, are you finding it heartening to see that there is more of a political momentum around this, albeit so far it's only from the opposition party? Yes, well, there's also been dissenting voices in all of the government parties, which is which is also heartening. At first, I'd like to thank the Labour Party for hosting me at this event and for the extremely uh, comprehensive and forthright uh, policy proposal. Um, there's nothing in there to disagree with, and I think the Labour Party has shown a large degree of leadership uh, in taking the strategy forward and also in, in owning the mistakes of the past that we have really made together as a society. Um, the government made certain choices and we allowed them to make those choices, and we have to learn from what has not worked. Um, I think that the Naming has obviously been controversial. Um, I see the Labour Party calls it aggressive suppression. That's what they called it in Australia as well. Um, and they did eliminate the virus. Um, I think that zero COVID is, is a misleading name. We use it because it's international. 
Uh, but it doesn't mean absolute zero. They don't have absolute zero cases in New Zealand or Australia. Uh, and it doesn't mean eradicating the virus either. Um, eradicating the virus means getting it down to absolutely no risk of encountering it. What we're doing is talking about eliminating it from defined geographical areas. So smallpox has been eradicated, but many other diseases have been eliminated from geographical areas. Having a zero COVID policy shouldn't be controversial. We have a zero TB policy. We've had a zero foot and mouth policy. The difficulty is this one is just so transmissible. And this is what makes it so dangerous. Um, but I think it's it's useful to think about this um, like a fire. It's, it's very useful to think of COVID like a fire because it doubles and doubles and doubles like a fire. And the problem is we've been treating COVID in Ireland more like a flood than a fire. A flood is something that happens to you because of the weather. There's nothing you can do about it. And you just have to suffer the damage and wait it out. And you do have to live with a flood to a certain extent. And if the government were to come out and say, we need a zero flood policy, well, that would be ridiculous. There's nothing they can do about it. They can only mitigate, mitigate against it when it happens. But fire is different. Fire is something that can be caused by nature or caused by human activity, but we can control it. Unlike a flood, a fire is something you can control. And in Ireland, we have a zero fire policy. When a fire breaks out, we put it out. We put it all the way out, not 90% of the way out, we put it all the way out, and we never allow it to spread from one building to another under any circumstances. As a result of this, we have no fires most of the time. We still get fires and they get introduced and we manage them. That's what a zero COVID policy is. It means zero tolerance for COVID. And the fires that will come in through the airport and through ports, you keep them burning in the fireplace for 10 days. That's what mandatory hotel quarantine is. If you don't do that, the fire gets out into the community and spreads. And of course, we have a very limited number of firefighters in the country. There are public health physicians. So when we think about it that way, that it's something that is achievable, desirable, and necessary, and not as absolute as perhaps the media may have presented it over the past six months, uh, it quickly becomes much more manageable for people to see that it really is the only approach that has worked internationally in this pandemic, um, and also that it is doable, and that it doesn't have to be perfect. And even if we don't get all the way there, the effort should lead its own rewards. And the closer we get to zero COVID, the more benefits we have and the less time we spend in lockdown. And of course, the less deaths, less hospital admissions and the less uh, long COVID that will suffer. Thanks for putting the case so eloquently, Tomas. I, I think through your writing and your speaking, you've really explained the strategy of zero COVID really well and really clearly. And I think for many of us, I mean, you know, as as, that, as you said, Alan and others have, have talked about how views have changed over the course of, the, of COVID. I think for many people, the idea of border control is much harder to accept, particularly for internationalists and so on, last year. And now I think the case is much more powerfully uh, evident there, particularly when we look at new variants coming in. And I would like to ask both of you about the ver this issue of variants in particular. Does this make the case for mandatory hotel quarantine for closure of borders or controls on borders much more clearly. Um, you know, what can we do to prevent the spread of these new variants, using that fire analogy that Tomas used? Gabriel, I'm going to ask you first. I think it's, well, it's been very clear from the beginning that uh, the virus only moves in one way internationally, and that's within human bodies. So it's people traveling that bring the virus in one form or another. Now, there has been the odd suggestion of it being associated with frozen seafood and so on, but that's on the absolute fringes. So the movement of people spreads disease, and so it has been for centuries and centuries and centuries. In fact, one of the last acts passed by the Irish Parliament in 1800 before it was abolished, it was a, an act on quarantine. And quarantine has been used for centuries successfully to stop the ingression of uh, infectious disease. And that's exactly what we should be doing with this. And so this disease, and it's, it, it's not about political borders. It's about creating a border that ke keeps out the virus. It's about uh, placing the controls that keep out the virus. It, nothing political about it. It's 
antiviral therapy, really. That's what um, uh, the, the controls are. So we're not closing the borders. What we're saying to the virus is you're not welcome here. And the way to make it not welcome is to, is to make sure that people coming in have to isolate have to isolate, must isolate, no more voluntary self-isolation, but must isolate in a safe way for themselves, for the people they're with and for the staff operating facilities They must be safe. And then they can uh, come out of that and then go about their, their business in a, in a country that will welcome them and where the virus will be under control. So I think it's absolutely important. And the variants do nothing but amplify that. The variants are dangerous. They uh, as we've already seen with the UK variant, it's more transmissible. And uh, a paper a few days ago on the 5th of uh, February suggested that it, uh, uh, from Public Health England uh, actually, um, said that it was 30% more uh, fatal uh, on the basis of the information they had. They said there was a need for more information still, but they are saying that. Uh, we know the South African variant has a, a different set of tricky characteristics which uh, can dodge part of the immunity arising from some of the vaccines. But variants um, of note are never going to be good news. A good news variant will not succeed as a, as a virus. It will, it will be outcompeted by a more aggressive, a more easily transmissible variant. So variants as they pop up are a problem. One of the big problems is the maldistribution in the world of the facilities to test for the variants. And we know that uh, uh, some countries have had very poor ability to do genetic sequencing and are struggling to build that up. Uh, the, uh, the United States being the, the main one, which has had very little capacity. But uh, there's a, the, the, the Biden plan has um, envisages enormous increase in that very rapidly. But there are many countries that don't have access to technology don't have the ability and don't have the resources to uh, crank up their genetic sequencing. So as the virus spreads in those countries, variants will appear and they may well spread unchecked, undetected until they are, cause enormous, enormous difficulties. So the fact that we know of a few variants in some parts of the world is a testimony uh, to the ability to gene sequence um, uh, those particular viruses, not that those are the only places by far where variants have occurred or can occur. So all that leads me to say that variants are extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult problem and a very, very important one to get right. If we don't get this one right, there will be no going back. You know, for some of the mistakes that have been made, you can kind of retrace your steps and do it a bit better or uh, do it better next time or something like that. But, but if a variant gets loose with really destructive characteristics, there is no going back. So that leads me back to keeping, um, keeping the variant out. It is, it's the third bit of that mantra about get it down, keep it down and keep it out. And keep it out is really important. Um, I, I, I do think it would be so much easier if there was cooperation uh, with Northern Ireland, and I've, I, I personally, I don't know if we're going to come on to that, are we? Are we going to come on? Oh, we'll come on to that. I'll leave my, I'll leave my comments. No, no, come on. Me. We'll make your comment now on it, actually, if you like, Emil, because it's such a, as you say, it's such a crucial issue. And apologies if the sound was poor. It's let me ask to take off my headphones. So I hope you can hear me well, better. I can hear you very well, anyway. I, uh, I, I think uh, the issue about the North is a very serious one, and I'm, uh, I am extraordinarily, ha having been a senior public health doctor in Northern Ireland for a long time and done my training in, in Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm very disappointed in the response. And Northern Ireland is the only part of Britain and Ireland that doesn't have local directors of public health and local public health teams led by them. And I think that's part of their problem. They have also uh, made serious errors in following uh, the, the the wisdom. The, we used to call it the wisdom from the East when I was uh, uh, work in Northern Ireland, uh, the wisdom from Whitehall, uh, and uh, in, in several ways. One was stopping testing and tracing on the, on the 13th of March and not resuming it until the end of April. And then when they did do so, they adopted a, a, a contact tracing approach that is out of step with the international advice, both from the European Centre for Disease Control and from uh, CDC in Atlanta. And in that they, and it differs from the position adopted uh, in the Republic when testing capacity 
increased substantially. They started testing. I think you started testing somewhere around the middle of May, mm. all close contacts. And the international advice is to test close contacts. And in fact, Northern Ireland sends people a text, says you've been a close contact and that you must self-isolate. You don't get tested unless you have symptoms. And we know that maybe 30% of cases are asymptomatic and will never have symptoms. So they have had entirely inadequate uh, control, infectious disease control in Northern Ireland, plus their attitude to the, uh, to, uh, the border issue is um, you know, unacceptable. If this was uh, uh, pigs, chickens, mm. or cattle we were talking about, there would be no problem in closing any border that would maintain farming incomes and the, and the integrity of, of farmers, herds, and, and stock. But for somehow, when it comes to people, they don't seem to count as much. And I, I'm extraordinarily disappointed and uh, I'm not very pleased. But uh, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Arling Foster was answering Prime Minister's question time, uh, uh, First Minister's question time in, in Stormont yesterday. And she was asked by a deputy about zero COVID and would, would she be meeting with the, the people who are advocates for zero COVID? And uh, she dis dismissed, dismissed us all as cranks. So uh, that's another badge of honour I have, being dismissed as a crank um, by uh, the First Minister. Well, Gabriel, thank you. That was fascinating. I hadn't quite appreciated that difference with uh, Northern Ireland. I'm going to ask Alan in a minute about you know, the political issues about that, because it has been so striking to all of us who've lived through foot and mouth how immediately... It, you know, a cross-border policy was implemented and the two jurisdictions worked together, as you say, when animal health was concerned, and how frustrating it has been for us in the opposition to keep hearing from the government that it's simply, it's not practical, we can't do it, and so on. Tomas, you know, you've, you've been very critical of the lack of cooperation north and south as well. Do you want to say some more about this in the context, particularly of these new variants? In the context of the new variants, um, we have to see this, I think, as a new pandemic within the pandemic. And we need to think if we could go back in time to March 2020, I think we all agree that we would do things very differently. I think we need to have the same attitude right now. The vaccine resistant variants, the variants that are potentially vaccine resistant, we need to keep those out and more will be arising. We don't have great genomic surveillance in Ireland. Uh, we've got very good testing capacity and we're a very good country for genome sequencing, but for some reason that hasn't penetrated how we, how we keep an eye on the virus in, in this country. We don't know about what variants are emerging. We don't have great surveillance on what might be here, but it doesn't seem to be the case that um, the Brazilian variant is here and it doesn't seem to be the case that we have a lot of the South African variant yet. We need to keep those out. We also keep, need to keep out new variants. But the, what we call the British variant is here, and it is dominant in the population now. And we haven't quite, I feel, come to terms with what this means for us. If you look at how Germany and other countries are dealing with their own situation, one of the reasons for the no COVID movement in Germany is because they are now about 10 to 20 percent of their SARS-CoV-2 population is that variant. and We could be close to 100 percent at the moment. It is the dominant strain in Ireland. This is far more difficult to suppress. And we may not be noticing this at the moment because we're all in lockdown anyway. Alan is right, it could be a stronger lockdown. And hopefully this is suppressing the B117 variant, although we're not even sure about that yet. But modeling studies done by my colleague, Professor Jerry Killeen and others have shown that theoretically, we can't live in level three with this variant, if we could kind of almost do it with the previous variant, it doesn't look like we can do level three with this variant. And so our concern is that once we start to open up, we're going to see the fourth wave happen much more quickly than even we saw the third wave because it didn't contribute to the Christmas wave, it came because of the Christmas wave. And so we could be heading for a fourth lockdown uh, much more quickly than, than we think. Um, so this is a game changer for how we manage it. I think it makes living with the virus even more untenable, but it doesn't stop us from, from eliminating the virus. Now, with respect to the question on Northern Ireland, um, yes, I think the First Minister's comments yesterday calling zero COVID advocates 
wax uh, was regrettable. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to remember that unionists are in an incredibly difficult position and we just can't expect them to take requests seriously uh, for, unless we get our own house in order. Uh, so when the Republic of Ireland is not quarantining international travel, there's no point in expecting uh, the DUP and the UUP to, to, to meet a theoretical idea that is going to be against what their, what their views are. So I think that there's a lot of things that we could be doing south of the border, uh, obviously much better, including in sharing contact tracing data with Northern Ireland that's, that's been happening far too slowly. But with respect to um, an all island approach, it is obviously ideal, we can discuss that later on, it's not necessary. We can have uh, a zero COVID strategy for the Republic of Ireland. And my view, and I, maybe this speaks to the foot and mouth issue, is that uh, Northern Ireland in many respects has been the excuse rather than the problem. And the real problem has been that the government has been reticent to stop international travel um, and to take responsibility for the public health component, the firefighting itself. Um, and that Northern Ireland is what they'll say, well, that's why we can't do it, throw our hands up in the air because of the border. Uh, but I remember when Northern Ireland announced their six week hard lockdown that was scheduled for St. Stephen's Day. Now that was an opportunity for an all island parallel collaborative strategy right there. But all of a sudden it wasn't really discussed anymore. And the mobility across the border, it's, it's, it's not necessarily as great as a problem as, as we may think, except for the Dublin to Belfast corridor. Um, and this can be managed. You know, we manage things regionally in Ireland already. We've had local lockdowns. We've already had border restrictions. We all have a five kilometer border around us right now. Um, and we think that there can be more, uh, act more proactive and less invasive ways of managing the border. Uh, like was done in Australia, when some states were zero COVID and some states were not, like has been done in Canada, where the eastern seaboard is basically zero COVID and bordering states are not. There, there are many creative ways of managing it. Um, so I think that that's, if we don't have an all-island island solution, we probably will never get to anywhere near where New Zealand is. But we can certainly get to somewhere that is far more livable uh, more like South Korea, you're still going to see people wearing masks. We're not going to be going to the Aviva Stadium, but we would have a situation where things would be manageable, social, uh, predictable, and, and without extensive lockdowns. And I think that's a far better way of living. Thanks, Tomas. A, a lot there. Really, uh, really insightful. Um, Alan, I'll, I'll ask you next about the, politi you know, the political questions that arise from what we've just heard from Gabriel and from Tomas, and I suppose in particular something I'm grappling with, and I think loads of people are that I'm speaking to, which is why are the governments so resistant to imposing border controls in some form? As Tomas has said, they're very keen to do it, and they seem to be fine doing it within, you know, for all of us living within a 5k radius. Um, and indeed, we see we saw it work successfully when we saw the Kildare lockdown and the localised lockdowns Tomas talked about. But there's such resistance to um, having any other sort of border control. And yet we see 110,000 people flying into Dublin Airport in January, over 60% of whom declare it's for non-essential travel. I looked at Dublin Airport arrivals, you know, yesterday evening there was a flight in from Lanzarote, and yet in Britain they've banned flights from the destinations where clearly travel is mostly going to be non-essential. So Alan, what do you think? What, why, why this resistance and what should we be doing? I, I think uh, both contributors have but they're, you know, really nailed it. I mean, politics has failed. Politics mm -hmm. has failed across both islands. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, a real issue in the north as regards measures being taken. I think uh, lots of mistakes obviously being made down here um, as well. Uh, you know, a, an all island strategy using the sea as our uh, as, as our mechanism to protect ourselves is is the most obvious thing. But we've been unable to do that. Failing that, the two island strategy. Um, but we've been unable to do that as well. And even the measures brought in this evening um, across the water, they are only applying to England. They don't apply to Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So, I mean, you know, from a comprehensivity point of view, it's still real uh, real issues. I think to most hit the nail on the head sometimes, 
we use the border as, as an excuse rather than actually it being reality. I mean, there's a mechanisms and ways in which to manage this. Um, and if they are executed, okay, it's not perfect. Having a border on an island like this isn't perfect. But if you actually put in place uh, enough measures uh, along close to the border, you can manage this. Um, you know, we're finding people for going beyond uh, their 5K for going for non-essential journeys across the country. Um, same issue in, as regards to the border. So this can be managed. And there are primary routes which can be, you know, watched permanently and then other routes where we can just ensure we have enough of a, uh, a resource on them. Uh, I think also there is, you know, there there is a situation in the government where they have really, really been slow in relation to quarantine. If you ask me about a failure, it's, it's striking that in May of last year, under Simon Harris, to be fair, he, he a group came together to look at quarantine, the whole issue of legislation, the whole issue of uh, the capacity, hotels, etc. But that essentially faded away. It actually didn't really meet. Um, a lot of this work should have been done a long time ago. And it is absolutely critical. And if you know, you talk about public support for what we're doing. You know, I, I've seen so many different polls. It doesn't matter which ones we cite because they're all the same. They're so high where people really just can't get their heads around why this is allowed to still happen, that people are traveling in and out of the country to get there. And it really infuriates people. I mean, it just really infuriates them. Um, because, I mean, if we are in a situation whereby we've gone through three lockdowns for the future, and I say this in crude terms because I think it needs impact, you know, are we in the future now going to lock down our own people again? And I agree with uh, uh, both uh, Gabriel and Tomas. We potentially could have a fourth one if we're not careful because of the variants. Um, are we going to continue to lock down our own people because we don't want to quarantine people coming in? I mean, if, if that is part, a part of a ratio, uh, you know, uh, choice, that, that for me is wrong. You know, we, we have to, we have a duty in relation to our own people. And we've got that balance wrong. I mean, we really need to be a hard line in relation to this uh, in order to ensure we don't have movement so we don't bring the virus in, as Gabriel has said. It comes in through people. It's as simple as that. Um, and we can do it. Look, it won't be perfect. And, you know, getting down to zero numbers is borderline impossible. But we can get it down to a point where Tomas is saying about where we can have some form of, you know, living. We're, we're not going into Croke Park. I'm not going to be watching February in an All Ireland hurling final in person, although I probably hopefully will be um, in 2021. But like, we're not going to have mass crowds like that. But we can have a situation where you know majority of activity is open in some capacity. We can have a, a where families can meet, where neighbours can meet, where people can meet outside, and all of this. We can achieve that, um, where we can get through this as the vaccines uh, rollout comes through. But if there is not an absolute um, you know, will from the government uh, to deal with these issues around the border, but most of all to deal with the issues of uh, travel, uh, airport and ports. Then, you know what, all the rest, I, I just don't think it's go going to deal with it. And on top of that, obviously, we need to resource our public health teams, uh, which I have question marks about as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. I think you're quite absolutely right about uh, public opinion. It's so clearly in favour of stricter controls and if it wasn't already, those uh, pictures on prime time about the travel people coming in from the flight from Lanzarote certainly uh, generated a huge uh, wave of people. Yeah, and also there was a pro there was a program on on RT Joe Duffy Live Nine uh, the other yeah. day, which I think is going to get it down in the annals of being famous for a long time. Uh, I suppose I, I asked you what you think the resistance is in government. I, I'm still, as I said, that's something. I think, I think I think the resistance. I think there's a resistance in government uh, to uh, the travel issue. Well, on the border issue, I think the issues were uh, simply political and maybe potentially trying to line up with Northern Ireland. It, it's just not going to happen by the looks of things. But in relation to the travel issue, I think there is a, an underlying resistance in some people. By the way. And I agree with Tomas, there are some people in government who are beginning to come along to our free thinking. Um, but there was a resistance in, in stopping people from travelling. And why? I don't know. But it certainly comes across that there were some members of government who really had an issue about, about doing that. Well, so, could I come in on that? Yeah, David, I mean, absolutely. And one of the things I did, 
I, when I was pointing very early on in the pandemic and as soon as it became clear you, New Zealand was taking a different route, I started talking about New Zealand. People said, oh, you can't compare Ireland or Britain to New Zealand. It's in the middle of nowhere, uh, uh, low population density, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it's not reliant on tourism the same way. In fact, uh, the tourist, uh, tourist days in Ireland and in New Zealand is more or less the same. People go to New Zealand for two or three weeks, whereas they come to Ireland for a weekend very often. So they're very alike. And I, so I, when I was wandering my way around the travel data, I looked up to try and find out the relative uh, mobility of the Irish population. Did they take a lot of flights? And I found they took a huge number of flights, huge. And uh, one of the highest in the world, in fact, sometimes the highest in the world, I couldn't believe it. And then I looked at the, this is World Bank data, I think it was. And it was because it was based on where the airline was headquartered. And I, that gave, gives you the clue. Airlines are very, very important economically in Ireland. They are big companies. And uh, I think, um, judging by the, the uh, unhelpful conversations I had uh, um, with uh, Michael O'Leary early in, in, the, uh, in those months. Uh, the, I didn't the, want uh, to raise that. But the, 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 air, the airlines are, are very capable of throwing their weight around and their economic weight. So I, I think there has been lobbying. I don't think it's just to do with politicians um, uh, thinking travel is a good thing. I think that, that you follow the money always. Well, thank you for that insight. And I must say, as a lawyer, I find it increasingly bizarre, the narrative from government that says that uh, there are constitutional difficulties and impediments to mandatory hotel quarantine. And yet we're imposing the most draconian uh, restrictions on constitutional rights and liberties of our citizens here yeah. in Ireland. And my colleagues in, in law schools across the country feel the same way and have been very vocal on this. Uh, Tumas, I'm going to come to you to ask a related question which has come in from the audience. As to uh, why has there been this failure in Europe to follow the scientific evidence and historic lessons that, that you and others um, ex um, calling for zero COVID have been expounding compared to parts of Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Why, the, why this difference? And again, I've seen an interesting discussion going on about how the how European jurisdictions in particular have failed to do this. Why, why is that? And, and what can we do now to change it? I think that um, there's been a lot of European exceptionalism uh, that has been applied from an early stage Asia was the Asian countries that were successful were prepared based on previous uh, experiences with SARS and MERS. Australia, New Zealand, not so much, uh, but they made a choice very early. Um, if you speak to anybody who's worked in Australia or New Zealand, or any, indeed an Australian or New Zealander, and we, the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group, have spoken to the equivalents of Dr. Tony Holin in those countries. Uh, they are as highly connected as we are, um, and it's, it's quite silly to assert that they're not. There's more water, but for that reason, they're just as dependent on their airports as we are, and they are globally competitive economies. The fact that we're part of the European Union is not really um, an impediment at all. European countries have been closing their borders throughout this pandemic. It's you're perfectly re reasonable to do so. We're not talking about closing the borders, we're talking about travel quarantine. Um, and that when you look at the diversity of countries that have achieved elimination, uh, you get large countries, you get small countries, you get islands and countries with large land borders, you get democracies and you get authoritarian states. Um, the only thing that they all have in common is that they made a political choice and they delivered on that choice. Um, so in this sense, happy families are all the same, but uh, unhappy families are unhappy in their own ways. And different countries have made mistakes for different reasons. Um, and though many people have made huge efforts in Ireland and in all European countries, uh, we've tripped up on a few different things, a few different few things that we weren't willing to do or things that we weren't willing to change. Um, in, this, in the case of Europe broadly, I, I would surmise that uh, we thought that we couldn't eliminate this virus because it was too transmissible, and we mistakenly thought that we could live with it. Both of those 
hypotheses have been proven wrong. We can't live with this virus in any kind of a simmering state. No country has succeeded in doing so, but many countries have succeeded in eliminating this. So we got it wrong uh, and we just have to change with the science. We have to look at what are the only approaches that have worked. We need to reverse engineer them for Europe. And in the case of Ireland, the island has done so much work for us already. We had very low cases in summer, the lowest in Europe in summer. That wasn't because of our lockdown, that was because we had the island doing a lot of the work for us. And we squandered that asset and we reseeded the country with new variants uh, towards the end of the summer. And I think that's a shame. Um, and I also think that in the case of Ireland, that our expectations unfortunately were set by very bad government uh, east and west of us. I don't mean in continental Europe, I mean uh, in Westminster and in Washington DC. And they, that created the, the yardstick that we were measuring ourselves uh, next to. I think if Britain and the United States had done things differently uh, in March that and thereafter, we probably would have found ourselves in a different situation uh, in this country. But I think that Europe is changing now. I think that movements are, there's a movement across Europe to move towards aggressive suppression in many countries, and in, there are no COVID movements now in Germany um, and in the Netherlands and in Finland. And I think Ireland is positioned to be an early adopter here because of our geography. And we, what we don't want to be doing, I think, is uh, go, arriving at the table very late uh, as one of the last European countries to get, to get things in order or even doing it only because Boris Johnson eventually goes to zero COVID, kicking and screaming, and then we follow. I think that would be a rather depressing way of doing it. I think we have the opportunity to be early innovators in Europe now in this new situation with new variants. Uh, and vaccines are a part of this, but um, I think that there's also a lot of miscommunication, um, lack of discussion in the media uh, also, which is leading to a kind of a vaccine complacency. Um, and for various reasons, vaccines are not going to change our situation for uh, a long period of time. And you speak about Michael O'Leary. He is of the mistaken view, which a lot of people have rather innocently, uh, that if we vaccinate the 700,000 most vulnerable people, that this will reduce the death rate so everything can go back to normal. Now, the long COVID issues aside, which we've heard about today, um, and we haven't had enough discussion about long COVID, which is affecting a lot of people. Uh, early vaccination only affects the potential deaths. So if you imagine in Ireland, if everybody were to be infected and we didn't overwhelm the ICU capacity, you would get about 40 to 50,000 deaths. Now, vaccinating the vulnerable population, which probably won't even really happen until May all going well, uh, would mean that that potential death toll would drop from 50,000 deaths to 10,000 deaths. Um, but that's not relevant because we're not going for herd immunity and we're not going to go and infect everyone with the virus. Uh, the major thing that will determine the death rate is not how quickly we vaccinate people this year. It's going to be the case numbers. And there, nobody wants to end up in a nightmare scenario where we do vaccinate those 700,000 people so we reduce the potential death rate from 50,000 to 10,000 people. And then we really let it rip and you will see the ICUs be overwhelmed with people between my age and 55 years of age. And it would be very ugly and there would be an awful lot of long COVID. Uh, and that situation, hopefully it will not happen anywhere, but it's perfectly possible that that would happen with bad management of, of vaccine expectations. And, and this, this uh, Ivana is, yeah. is is a well-recognized phenomenon. It's called the prevention paradox, that by acting to deal with those at most at risk and not bothering to protect those at moderate or low risk, you expose those at moderate and low risk to an awful lot of risk because there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. and, and that adds up to a huge, as, as Thomas has very eloquently explained, to a mm. huge death toll. So it, it's a very, very dangerous not to understand this. Very dangerous. Yeah, thank you. You've you both put that so clearly. I mean, and, and it's a huge, huge fear. 
I, and I was just struck listening to you there, Tomas, that we're 45 minutes into a conversation about COVID and that's the first mention of vaccines, I think. I, I think, you know, that there's been such a shift again in public mood and public discourse where we all thought even six weeks ago that, you know, the vaccines would arrive, the sort of Ryanair scenario, and everyone would be fine. And now it's becoming increasingly clear that that simply isn't so. Um, and, that, and that we have to look beyond vaccines and have a broader strategy. Um, I'm going to ask you each one final question, if I may, and starting with you, Gabriel, and then Tomas, and I'll give you the last word on it, Alan, which is given that um, there's been a recent plateauing, albeit tonight we're seeing somewhat better uh, reduction in figures, but seeing so many people still being admitted to hospital, so many still in ICU, um, clearly, as we've all expressed tonight, we want to see ambition from government. So what specifically would you like to see the government say tomorrow in response to the Labour motion and, and I suppose in response to everything that has happened in terms of, of an ambitious strategy? Gabriel, if you could just sum up, what, what would be your hope for the government tomorrow? Um... Now you're asking me to fantasize. I think. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, it would be, it would be wonderful if they would really say, you know, that they are now going to put together a strategy and they're going to put it together within a matter of days. Do the thinking. It's it's strategic thinking that is needed, and uh, not not knee jerk reactions dealing with one issue and then another issue and then another issue, and that they are going to put some of the best brains to work on it, the best brains across the civil service, some of the best brains in the country, and get them to work up a, a proper strategy. And people who can, a, a few people who can look at it with fresh eyes and can, and, and, and can think their way through the, the, the mound of clear guidance there is, uh, the clear evidence there is. I mean, one of the great failures is a failure to look at other places that have done it well, find out how they've done so well and copy it. And uh, you know, movement on any of those issues about getting a strategy, looking at other places that have done it well and uh, what they did, um, even uh, you know, even a commitment I think to uh, on on the borders would just mean so much to a lot of people. I, I really think public health controls on the borders, and if I had one uh, one particular, which I would really like them uh, to, to to really take public health medicine seriously, uh, because it's amazing how badly it has been treated for decades now. And, and, the, and the public health people continue to be, even in the midst of this um, pandemic, not treated well. And if you're not treating the people you're relying on to, 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 to re at, the front, at the front end of it, really sort it out on the ground, you're not going to, you're not, uh, you know, I would love to see the directors of public health in the regions across the Republic given a responsibility. People don't know who they are. They don't know who their local director of public health is, and they should be given responsibility, resources, and, uh, and a roadmap. Uh, uh, not, not for opening up, but for closing down the virus. Thanks. That's a very, a very strong finish and a good, good fantasy. Let's hope we'll see it come into, uh, come into effect tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, Tomas, what would your hope be for uh, in terms of government response tomorrow? And we did hear from the Tonish to the sea from Leo Bradford. Yes, he is still the Tonish this evening. Uh, a suggestion of a move towards a two island strategy. So I'm gonna I'll ask you and Alan both about what you, what you think about that. Well, I think we were expecting a detailed plan within two weeks. Um, it has to move away from living with the virus. Living with the virus is no longer tenable with these new variants. I think that we need to have a strategy of aggressive suppression towards zero. This immediately needs uh, travel quarantine to be put in place. I think for all travel origins, it needs to be managed sensibly, not to make the mistakes of Victoria, where private companies uh, were allowed to drop the ball in a serious way, probably to use the defense forces for a finite uh, number of hotels to monitor them in a very serious way. Um, and that needs to be in place uh, by the time we get to about 100 to 200 cases a day. That's when new, new cases really start making a difference. And also we're worried about the new variants. Um, I would like to see some regional zoning of the country. We've already seen that red zones work, that local lockdowns work. And I think that the Minister of Health deserves a lot of credit for that because he did that against much opposition within government and also 
uh, through the media and from the public, but, but they work. We never did the other side. We never did green zones. Um, one of my colleagues often remarks that the real the scandal is not that Ireland is not zero COVID. The scandal is that Kerry is not zero COVID. There's absolutely no reason why about 50% of the Republic of Ireland right now in the more rural areas should not be zero COVID. Many of them could have been zero COVID before Christmas if we had managed it correctly. And these places need to be protected and they need to be given more freedom and people cannot go into them except for very essential reasons. This also makes it easier to hunt out the virus. Probably doesn't make sense to do it on a county by county basis because then you get into some absurdities at the border, but you can do it based on epidemiological zones or commuter zones. Uh, you could divide the country into five or six areas in that respect. And this is an equitable way of dealing with Northern Ireland because then you just treat the border the same way you treat other geography, other geographical regions of the Republic of Ireland. And so I think it's a nuisance, but it will improve uh, the quality of life, I think, for many people. And it will also create local community efforts that your, your, your county or your region is trying to get to zero. It's not just the government putting everyone in lockdowns the entire time. Um, and the last thing, of course, is, is, is uh, greatly uh, resourcing our public health capacity. I'm not a public health expert, so I'm not going to comment on the details in the way that Gabrielle Scali will. Uh, but I've learned a lot about it in the past year. Um, and the reality is we only have of the order of 60 of these professionals in the country. And it seems to me that it shouldn't be rocket science to hyper-resource them. If you need to give every public health physician 10 administrative assistants and 10 good junior doctors and a different level of control over their patch of the country than the typical model in which they work allows, then we would be in a position to control outbreaks like proper firefighters in a panzer-like fashion as Alan Kelly has already described. Um, all of these things I think should be done within a month using a wartime mentality. Uh, and then I think that they are achievable. Thanks, Tomas. And again, that's a good positive way to finish. I mean, I, I think it's, it's good. And in fact, we were talking about this earlier, Alan and I, the need for people to have hope that we can move beyond this and that we can achieve a change in approach and start to live lives again. I think all of us have somewhat Stockholm syndrome. We're, we're all so used now to being so confined that we're almost we're almost sort of beaten into living with it. But, uh, but actually, it's, it's simply not sustainable. So, Alan, if you had a wish about how the government would react tomorrow to the Labour motion. And I think it's at 10 a.m. tomorrow in the Dáil, isn't it? So yeah. what, what, what do you want them to say in response? Well, I'd just like them to listen. I'd like them to move the politics aside and just listen um, to what a, a majority of, of everybody in the opposition are kind of on the one page on. Um, I'd really like them to uh, listen to the components and deal with them individually and say why they can't do them all. Uh, it's not a case of who came up with it first. Uh, government have made mistakes, opposition have made mistakes. We all learned through this process. Uh, but there's just simple facts here. We cannot keep going in and out of lockdown. You know, society, we can't deal with it. It's, it's now at a point where we have to have a proper strategy. I don't want to come out of tomorrow's debate without knowing that there is a proper strategy being put in place. I worry that the Tawnish should come out today and said what he said about two weeks' time because he knows the debate tomorrow was happening and he had to get ahead of it. That, to me, is not a strategy. Um, I want to uh, also uh, hear from them as regards what I think is really, uh, you know, the last conversation we had with Gabriel and Tomas in relation to, and I took a note of it, uh, Gabriel said it, uh, preventative paradox. You know, the whole issue in relation to the vaccine the whole issue in relation to where we're going for the rest of 2021, the whole issue that, you know, that, you know, 2020 are, is 2021 is going to be like 2020, you know, except potentially worse uh, because the variants, the mutations create a dynamic that, you know, wasn't there at the early part of last year, but very much is now and speeds up uh, once you open up. And that is something we haven't dealt with before. Um, so how are they going to ensure that we aren't going to face that again? Um, I'm deeply concerned at the comments of the Tonish as regards. It sounds like he's just waiting for vaccines to roll out, the summer to come, and then we're going to open up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
But because of what the two uh, 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 gentlemen on this uh, video call have actually demonstrated quite eloquently, that isn't going to work this time in any way, shape, or form. It didn't work before, but the variance this time around mean we could end up in a forward lockdown very quickly. Now, can you imagine our society facing into that, even as we're rolling out vaccines? And that is a distinct reality. So what I want to hear from them tomorrow is that they are going to listen. They're going to go through the components of what we've put forward, because we've put forward all the components of zero COVID, as uh, you can see from uh, our motion, and that they will engage with us and actually adopt them. And hopefully, collectively, we can get to being more or less on the one page as regards to strategy for the people of Ireland uh, for the next few months. And then when we have driven down the virus, when we have hopefully resourced up uh, to some extent our public health teams, we can, um, you know, panzer like attack the virus and open up our society in some way uh, so that we can have, uh, you know, we can give people hope as the vaccine roll happens. But certainly this is going to go on for a considerable period of time. So the government need to have a strategy. That's what I want to hear tomorrow. Yeah, I think that there's a clear message there and a clear ask for government on the strategy. We didn't have time to get to an issue I, I wanted to ask you to talk about, which was the impact of the COVID and, and restrictions on children in particular, on those children with additional needs, but all children also have been deprived so much time at school, so much time in extracurricular activities and sports and so on, and the impacts that COVID and restrictions would have had on them. And I think that's a lost generation we're looking at potentially. And of course, the appalling vista of more lockdowns, of lack of strategy and so on, just um, um, really make, you know, makes the prospect so much worse for children. I've been calling for a catch-up for children scheme to be launched by the government to ensure that there is uh, a recognition, practical recognition of the impacts that uh, soldiers have had upon children. So we'll come back to that on another occasion. Uh, for tonight, I'm conscious it's eight o'clock and we want to finish up. Um, I just want to express our really sincere appreciation to both you, Professor Daly, and to Dr. Ryan for joining us this evening, giving us the benefit of your expertise, and also to thank you on my behalf and the behalf of the Labour Party for all of the incredible advocacy you've been doing over recent months yeah. and to persuade it. And I know, Alan, you know, you, you, you said the same. I mean, it's been so important for us trying to navigate a political response to the, to the crisis to hear this calm, well-reasoned, well-informed, um, you know, discussion and uh, development of ideas as to, how, as, to, as to how a strategy can be adopted that will actually tackle COVID. It's just a pity perhaps the government haven't heard it quite as clearly, it seems, as opposition parties had, but you've really made a difference. And I think you've really shifted the public discourse and the political dynamic and the momentum too. And our motion tomorrow is part of that and bring it in that so Alan, I don't know if you want to say a final word of thanks. No, just to thank you, Ivana, for chairing tonight. Thank to, thanks to Gabriel and Tomas. Um, we'll stay engaged and with both of you and all other uh, experts as well to try and uh, get, make change and try and ensure we do get that strategy somehow uh, for the country, for the betterment of our people. So thank you very much and thanks to everybody who's logged on and watched this tonight. I hope it's been very informative. Okay, thanks Alan, thank you to all who've tuned in tonight. We're going to finish up now at eight o'clock and thanks again to our experts and to Alan uh, for such an informative and interesting panel discussion. Thank you. <laughs>